The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. The following video is presented by the Center for Educational Media in partnership with Professional Educators of Tennessee's Leader U Conference. For more professional development videos, check out our website at www.mtsu.edu slash CEM. I'm Carolyn Reno. I'm on the Board of Directors for Professional Educators of Tennessee. So I'm excited to have Mike Mitchell join us today. I'm kind of biased here and very excited about this because I live in Murray County now, teach in Williamson, but he is one of the people that is changing Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. That was a sleepy little community that was the edge of nowhere, it felt like. And it has become a place where people want to move because of the schools. And Dr. Jackson, who's been one of our speakers here before, is a big part of that. But he brought in Mr. Mitchell to direct the Kids on Stage. So my kids went to Kids on Stage when it was a summer program at Hillsborough School, and it has theater and arts. And you had Michael McDonald come in and play for the kids, you know, just because he lived in the area. I mean, it's just this amazing program that introduces kids to concepts of math and things like that through music and theater and arts and visual and video and all sorts of opportunities for the Nashville area too to form careers and begin with the end in mind. They get to have all this great influence that um, he's bringing into all three schools. So there's three schools there working together, 100 teachers. Uh, Dr. Jackson is his direct uh, boss and they work together with, the, with all the teachers in, in Mount Pleasant to bring all these programs together into the classroom and through all the grade levels, cross, crossing all the grade levels. So with that, thank you so much for being here. We're very excited. I'm excited too. So I'm Mike Mitchell. Um, I'm the Kids on Stage Art Director for Mount Pleasant Schools. Um, thank you for that lovely um, introduction. And we really do think that we are changing what's happening in Mount Pleasant. And our idea and our goal is that we don't want to keep it a secret. You know, sometimes people want to kind of keep things a secret. This is my harmonica. You can't play with it. Like, that's because this has germs on it. We want to, like, wipe it off and hand it to you and let you play as well. Like, we really want to share what we're up to. We think it's a model that's repeatable. We don't think that it's identically repeatable because your community is different than ours, but we do like this idea of bridging the private industry and public school gap and figuring out ways in which to partner to get the strength of that private industry involved in public education and really create something that's never been created before. Constantly leading towards a constantly changing target is what I was asked to come up with, and that was four months ago, and it really felt like that. It felt like things were just shifting daily. We had a, a really rough school year, just like I'm sure everyone else did. There was a lot of tragedy on our property, and I mean in the worst possible way. Um, there were lots of people that I worked with who lost loved ones. I mean, it was just a really, really, really tough year. I'm sure that's no different than you all's year. And so when I was thinking about a title for this, I was like, well, what's the best thing that kind of connects or really kind of um, underscores like what my career in 20 years of teaching and being in education has been like, and it's constantly leading, right? I feel like I'm a leader. I don't necessarily think I'm anyone's boss, because I'm not, but I do feel like I've led in my career, um, and I want to kind of just take you on that path of like ways in which I feel like I've led, and then why I kind of talked about constantly changing targets. By the way, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff. I'm an art teacher um, by trade, and so I'm really comfortable with the complexity and when things don't necessarily make sense in a continuous line. But I know that that doesn't necessarily mean it's the way that everyone might see it. So if you're like, why did you talk about that? Can we go back? Feel free. I've, I've literally put this together up until the last minute, not because I'm lazy or because I am a procrastinator. I just kept thinking of things to put in there. And I thought, 
I don't know if I can talk for an hour and a half. I know I can talk for an hour and a half. I don't know if I can make it interesting. So I just kept dropping in. I can talk for days. If y'all left and there was a world record thing, I could talk for days. Um, but I wanted to make sure or try to make sure that I could throw things in there um, to that you guys could kind of connect to. Um, I love talking about arts and STEM because it re means I'm really talking to everyone in the room, whether you're a, a classroom teacher or an administrator. Um, and please feel free to ask questions. I was integral to, in that team that got uh, TSIN certification for all three schools at the same time. And so I'm more than happy to kind of answer those questions and connect you to, um, to any of those kinds of ideas. So um, kids on stage, what my job is, is I get to collaborate. I'm like, my boss tells me, hey man, you're collaborative. You need to build capacity in your peers and in teachers and in administrators. You need to support all 100 people on the property. You need to also be a resource that's available to all 24 schools in the county, right? And then art, 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 make it steam, 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 and then just dream up the biggest idea you possibly can. So I literally have a job that is a dream job um, because I actually get to dream. It doesn't mean that I get to necessarily make all my dreams come true. Some of you may know Tim Drinkwine. Tim, my first year there, he said to me in a very, really sweet moment, Mike, we can do anything that you want to do, but we can't do everything that you want to do. And that was really helpful to me to, for what he was saying was like, hey man, you need to land some of these planes so we can believe in you because you are really good at just coming up with ideas, but let's see some proof of concept and land some of these projects because then that will help you with buy-in with teachers. I love Tim, it was such a great lesson for me as a leader to be led in that way. So constantly changing targets, like y'all, the, these are the organizations that I've served in in my very short career. I've served at the Our 21st Century Community Learning Center, which was a federally funded Department of Education grant that ran through the University of Florida in Hastings, Florida, population 600. I lived there with my wife and our little baby boy. Um, I did a project at the Hastings Library. I've worked as an adjunct professor at the University of Memphis, an adjunct professor at Austin Peay State University, adjunct professor at Flagler College, Bethel University, the Art Institute of Tennessee, Neely's Bend Elementary School, Maplewood High School, Father Ryan High School, and now I'm currently at the Kids on Stage, I'm the Kids on Stage Art Director at Mount Pleasant Schools. And then you see this little dot, 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 because I know that I won't necessarily always be there. I would love to be. It's really awesome, but I also commute 68 miles each way and I've been doing that for three years. I'm not tired of it. I've got a little Prius and it's lovely and it's, I listen to the Armchair Expert podcast and I'm getting close to listening to all 400 episodes. Um, and so and then I'll move to another podcast, right? But do you think that all of these organizations have the same stated goals and missions, right? Like I see shaking heads. And even inside of each one of those, do those even stay the same? And so, I realized that in my career, I actually was perfectly training myself for a moment like this when everything feels chaotic because I've always had every couple years a different boss. By the way, I don't think it's because I'm a bad employee, right? I just think that I am part of that generation that is, has, when that shift happened where we were moving a lot. Wendy and I were living in Florida. I would have died there, but we bought a house at the worst possible time in the history of Florida, right? And we kind of got like, oh, maybe we should go home a little bit. We just had a little kid, and so we thought, well, we're gonna go home and kind of take this hit, build our credit back up. So it wasn't that I've intentionally wanted to build um, a resume where I'm like, hey, I, I've taught across all these different kinds of disciplines and dis different kinds of like sectors, but it has been important to me, and I've learned a lot from that because of those situations. I loved Father Ryan. I didn't expect to love it so much. I'm not Catholic. Um, I grew up a little bit with a kind of a chip on my shoulder about folks that I thought had money. And I grew up in Nashville and had never been invited on that property. And then I went and taught there. And what happens when you're around kids, right? You fall in love with kids and realize, man, these kids are amazing. And you met a bunch of cool kids. You met a bunch of cool families. And so for me, that was awesome too. And a huge lesson for me to really actually Feel it in my bone marrow, not just in my head, that kids are kids are kids, right? And so that was helpful for me um, <clears throat> in that experience of no longer, not even a little bit, ever demonizing like, like where families would choose to send their kids, right? I am a public school kid. 
right? I've gone to a couple private colleges, but I've met a ton of people that have really great experiences. Um, Natalie and I are in this group called the Educators Cooperative, and we have a friend named Sherry, and Sherry teaches at the Lyndon Waldorf School, and they don't allow computers in the building, right? They have chalkboards, like right now. They're, they're, they're doing lessons with chalkboards, and she loves that place, and she's awesome, and she's a 46-year veteran of education that has taught me a lot, and it's like, oh, why would I miss out on what Sherry has to offer? So Father Ryan was a big key for me, and it helps me daily with what I'm doing for kids in Murray County Public Schools. Um, so that'll be something that you'll kind of hear me talk about is like moving across sectors. But because I've moved across sectors so much and I've moved from different places and had different bosses, I've realized only in setting up this talk that I've created a filter for myself. And it's like everything's going to be okay, right? And the filter is I run all of my professional situations through that, right? What kind of opportunity does it create for me so that I can better serve kids? And if it does that, then I can get on board with it. Because there were a lot of things that didn't overlap my Venn diagram at Father Ryan that I could have talked myself out of that position. But there was a place that wanted me, which was cool for a teacher to have somebody kind of reach out to you and say, hey, come over here. That doesn't happen a lot to all of us. Certainly doesn't happen to our teachers that find themselves in one little classroom in a portable with no running water. People don't typically say, hey, come over here and teach here. So that was a cool experience. But I was like, hey, this is an opportunity to get outside of my own um, kind of situation about what I normally would do. And then it helped me understand how do I best serve kids. This particular kid is a senior, was a senior at Maplewood. She was so quiet. She was so quiet. And in a class of 39, you can get lost pretty easily, especially if you're a quiet kid. And so I gave her this opportunity to create something for her school for our principal, uh, Dr. Woodard, who some of you may know. I worked for Dr. Woodard and, Ryan, and Dr. Ryan Jackson at Maplewood High School. Um, and we'll get, to those, we'll get to Dr. Jackson later. But anyway, she created this really cool thing, right? So here's this kid. You know, she's a senior. You can see my chaos behind her, my art room is chaos. But she's got GPA and EOC and ACT and then football and basketball and all these different kinds of things. So I think that's really, it's really cool to, you'll, you'll hear me talk about that too a lot. I think that art is the way in which I'm gonna have conversations with kids that will allow them to better kind of navigate their own social and economic ecosystems as well as like the larger social and economic, economic systems. And I choose art, that's my thing. Raise your hand if you're not an art teacher in this, in this room. Everyone in this room has chosen a different way in which you want to help kids navigate. But I bet that that's, if it's not exactly the way you think about it, I bet you don't disagree with that. That's some of what we're doing is helping kids navigate and be successful in our immediate community. And then if they wanna step out of that community to be able to be successful, right? I always tell kids, man, there's nothing wrong with living in Mount Pleasant. It's a cool little town. If I didn't have a kid who was really happy in his school in Nashville, I'd move there tomorrow. Like, it's really a neat little town. But, but we're set in this situation. I'm not going to disrupt my, my kids' education because I want to choose a cool town. But I always tell kids, hey, living in here, there's nothing wrong with it. But just make sure that you're choosing to be here. Because having to be somewhere is a really different story, right? I chose to live in Hastings, Florida, this little town of 700, and it was awesome. But I met a lot of people that didn't have that choice and they didn't feel the same way. Um, and so... I think that that's, for me, art's my jam, what's your, so let's just hear it, like, shout out, like, I'm going to point out, what's, what's your, how do you connect with kids, what's your field? Well, I'm an English teacher, and I'm also a coordinator for a, a program in our county to help juniors and seniors who are in danger of not graduating on time get their credits so they can graduate on time through a computer-based program. Awesome. Well, that's awesome. What do you do, sir? I'm a principal at the alternative school where we all are coming from. When you say we all, is this, this table? So where are you all coming uh, from? Roan County. Roan County? Yes. And what's... Knoxville. So, oh, cool. Real yes. close. All right. Real close to Knoxville. He's also a history teacher. And I'm a Ryan. history teacher at the same time. Okay. So, so you've said history, but then now administration, you're going to impact a larger group and do both. Yes. How about I'm you? Mathematics. Mathematics? Special education. Okay. Science. Science. Okay. Uh, elementary, special education, but I teach reading through history. Okay. Fourth grade social studies and science. Awesome. I'm not currently a teacher, but I taught English and I love that. That was my jam. Okay. Awesome. So to me, I think I'm really excited because 
no one shares my exact overlap today, which is exactly what I get to do every day, which is figure out ways in which my funky art ideas can connect to what you all are up to. So when we're doing all of this stuff, none of what I wanna show you is about like, oh, you, you should do this, right? Oh, you, this would work here. But we have done that with lots of teachers in Mount Pleasant and done cool ideas. So I think really open to being collaborative. Um, I talk about collaboration a lot. One thing I didn't put in the slide because I just I don't have the rights to kind of like talk about her book, but um, Susan Cain's book, Quiet, about like introverts. One of the things I really want to point out, I think it's important to look at that data, like I'm super extroverted, I'm super excited about being around people, and I just did a thing that I probably wouldn't do in my classroom, which is point at you without having your consent to say like, start talking, right? Um, but I feel like, I assume most of you all probably were here, and I also didn't see anyone that was that, I, I was looking to make sure no one was like, oh, don't do the thing to me. But during this thing, if you don't feel like talking in front of a whole group, I think it's important if no one's ever said this to you, like introverts are not failed extroverts, right? Coming from an introvert. And I spent a long time in my career kind of feeling that way until I saw her TED talk and I immediately changed the way I talk, immediately. I immediately changed the way I talk. So I don't know if, if you guys have seen that work, her work, it is really, really powerful. It's really cool. I'm the opposite of what she did, but she went to summer camp when she was a little girl and packed books and thought she was going there to read with other kids and was like blown away that they wanted to talk to her. She couldn't fathom that. So um, it's a really neat thing. I believe art is the heat that turns STEM into STEAM, right? So we hear this word STEM, this acronym, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, there's a ton of data, but I love this quote. Um, at a University of Central Florida, right in the bottom part, it says programmers and engineers are increasingly teamed up with artists to co-develop software, products, renderings, and more because we're looking for this um, demand of like themed experiences, gaming, and, and then specifically like simulation and training. And they're, they're asking for artists to kind of connect with those engineers and designers. And so to me, art, I think it's really cool. I think it's really valuable. I can talk a bunch, I can tell you a bunch of, uh, anecdotal things, but also there's a ton of evidence that says, hey, what Mike's talking about, like his jam, it's actually a really powerful thing that can be really important for kids and help those kids find their voice. And when I say their voice, I don't mean necessarily their vocal voice. I mean their voice inside that's truly who they are and what they want to be and what they want to express and how they want to impact the world. Our strength in the arts in Mount Pleasant, we're critical to our getting the TSIN STEM certification for all three schools in our cluster. I initially didn't have all the stuff about TSIN, but then I bumped into Thomas this morning. And I thought, oh, I bet some people would really be open and interested in hearing me talk about that. And I love talking about it. It was a really cool process. Um, and I, can, I think I could probably help you um, with, uh, with some of that stuff. And by the way, I'm publicly saying it, please use me as a resource. Get my email address. I've already asked if I can come to your school. I really mean it. Um, our keynote speaker said it this morning, kind of. And you guys who are my ELA folks are gonna say, no, leadership is actually a noun. But my sculpture professor in graduate school always said, art is a verb. And his point to that was like, stop telling me what you're gonna do. Stop telling me what cool sculpture you're gonna make. There's a big studio down at the end of the hall. Go make that thing and then come ask if you, for some feedback about what this stuff looks like. Leader, art is a verb. And so I thought about that this morning and leadership is us doing things, not complaining about things, right? I think those things are important. Right, like I get that sometimes you just need to vent with people. We need to talk. The the the, the special, you're like you're doing the, the you guys over here. You, you guys could get together and talk about policy and you just gripe. But the leadership of what you're doing to help kids, to me, that's the verb part, right? So I think leadership's a verb. I put me skateboarding because I have a 14 year old. Um, kid who's a, a 15 year old, just turned 15. He's a really, really good skateboarder. I am not anymore. I used to be a decent skateboarder, but I do think it's powerful to him that in, at 47 with a bone on bone knee, tomorrow we're leaving to go to Birmingham because we've heard about this cool skate park and we're gonna go skate that before we go on. You know, And so I think it's important that he sees me doing, instead of saying all the excuses I have that are legitimate, 
I'm too overweight, I'm too old, I could hurt my, like all those things are legitimate and true. But anyway, I get out there and I do it anyway. And I've gotten pretty decent at uh, doing these little nose manuals. Um, when we talk about really anything, especially with kids and especially with, um, with our colleagues, I bet if we went around this room and everyone could truly not worry about um, what other people thought and would just really brag on themselves because most of us won't, I bet everyone in here has something that's pretty neat that they've done. This is me when I was 15 in that gym, wherever it is here, in the state tournament. I was a sophomore in high school. This was on the front page of the Tennessean the next day. Before the internet, being on the front page of the Tennessean was like being on the front page of the internet. It was a big deal, people. And so I think that we're often capable of things that surprise others and sometimes ourselves. I never walked into that game thinking, I'm gonna dunk on two dudes who have D1 scholarships. I mean, we're gonna win that game and then we're gonna win the next game and then we're gonna win the state championship even though my brother and I sat out because of our religious beliefs. I didn't, no one, I didn't have that ability, but my coach believed it. I think we are those teachers that can see that for our students. We can see, hey man, you can get there, right? Like New York really is just, if you got in a car and drove for 14 miles, you'd be there. Our kids think it's an impossibility. And when I see our kids, I mean the kids I taught at Father Ryan and Maple, like we put these blocks, kids put these blocks in their heads and their community can put their blocks in their heads. So I think that sometimes we have to be that person that kind of shows them that they can do it and they can surprise themselves and others. This is my big brother. You can barely see him. He would love it because you can't see him. This is my coach. And my brother got his number retired. But coach called me and said, man, Mike, I don't have those jerseys. I got rid of them. I gave them to the community center and I didn't think about it. I gave them away in like 1992 or three when you guys got new trophies. I said, doc, no problem. I'm an artist. I said, I'll fix that for you. And uh, I cut out a piece of canvas. I found the old newspaper article and I just built that jersey. There was a, we had American flags during the Gulf War. We had them on our uniforms. And so I just, I just made it. So in the slide, when I asked like, what's your jam? For me, it's art. And so it's important for me to be an artist when I'm teaching kids. It's important for me to be actively making work. That's not going to look like my friend Virginia, who's from Lebanon, who is in the Venice Biennale right now. It's the coolest thing, y'all. She's from Lebanon, Tennessee, and she's in the biggest art exhibit on the planet. It's awesome. It's unheard of. It would be like if one of your kids went to the Super Bowl. It's that, it's that massive of a gap from playing high school football to playing the Super Bowl. Virginia is in the Venice Biennale. Art, art uh, Forum, which is like the Sports Illustrated of the art world, did a 10-page article on her. You know, and I, bumped, I met her in graduate school. Um, I don't have the time, talent, like, I, like it's not just, just because I had the time I'd be able to have her career. Like it's a, that's a one in a, it's, it's like a generational kind of thing. She's like literally like an NBA, WNBA player. Like it's that big a deal, right? But I don't have, I'm not gonna have her career. So I'm, but I'm not gonna tell kids, well, I'm not an artist because I can also figure out how to have a career, right? There's a golf pro at your local golf course that's better than we all are, and she doesn't play on the PGA, but we go to her and ask for advice. So in my community, I can be a professional artist, and I'm gonna be the best professional artist that I can be, and I'm gonna lead in that way. And so what I do is I typically kind of follow my nose, right? So this is a project that would never be in a gallery, but there's part of me that loves it because it fooled 2,000 people on an award ceremony and everyone thought it was the jersey that they were seeing behind them, right? And it really, and for me, it kind of became a resume piece. At one point I was looking to, to work at MLK and I actually pointed to that for, um, as, my, as my kind of resume, okay. All right, so I'm gonna switch to something now which everybody in this room can connect to, right? Not necessarily Poetry Out Loud, Poetry Out Loud is just for high school. This is Brianna Folks. Brianna has never participated in Poetry Out Loud. Poetry Out Loud is, is done through the Tennessee Arts Commission. Tennessee Arts Commission is my license plate, the Burton Calicut Rainbow, right? And I was really lucky in graduate school, I moved next door to him. This is the weirdest thing. This is a, we lived in a little rental house. Like, there's no way this internationally known artist is living in this house in Memphis, but Burton lived right next door to us. Um, but those, that money, every time I, someone pays for a personalized plate, it goes into this big pot of money. And then the Tennessee Arts Commission is, is um, they have to then give that money out. And there's all different kinds of grants. So raise your hand if you're rural. 
they are looking for you guys to apply for grants. If you are not unfamiliar with how to do those, you want help, call me, I can connect you to them. You can also reach out to them. They pick up the phone. So they came to us. Can I ask you what exactly arts mean? Yeah, so for Tennessee arts, it's gonna be broad. Storytelling, fiddling, dancing, music, theater scene, okay. weaving. It's, and it's a little art. Oh yeah, it's, it's really broad, really, really broad. And I'll show, and, and we can talk about something in a minute, uh, but I just wanna, with Tennessee Arts Commissions, I've got another slide, so we won't lose that. So Brianna, you host a poetry competition at your school. Um, any high school folks here? All right, so everyone who's high school can host, you can host a competition at your school. And the winner of your school, they never ask how it works. We've done it when we had two kids, and then we've done it this year where we had 90 kids. Never did they say, sorry, your kid's champion's not our champion. When your kid wins, they go to the state tournament. You send a kid to the state tournament, they will reimburse that family for hotel and money, and they go to the Tennessee Museum and they compete. It's amazing. For, uh, sophomore, fourth place. First place, Senior from BGA is going to Yale, right? And then two other private schools, both seniors. Brianna goes to fourth place. And you could, everybody was like, man, her voice, you can tell it's something that's been a thing in her life. She's got this big, deep voice. It's awesome. I love it. And I think she's grown to love it, but it was really neat to see her in an environment, which could never happen in my own community. She's already had all the people kind of talk about it and felt self-conscious. But when she was in a new community, when we positioned her for free to go to the Tennessee Arts Commission, have food, take her family and pay for them, her aunt and her mom came and they had a blast. And then she heard people talk about her voice. They be she believed in it in a different way because she's like, oh, I do have a cool voice because that cool girl, right, who's my peer, who's going to Yale, said I had a cool voice. Mr. Mitchell isn't just full of it, right? Like, I actually believe it because I was around another person doing this thing. So she'll go back. I said, do you want to do it next year? And she said, I don't want to do it next year. I want to win it next year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we think she's going to. All right, we talked about this a little bit before. You don't have to be a lead. You don't have to be in leadership, right? You don't have to be in the verb of leading um, in that kind of position to lead. You can join a board of directors. You can volunteer, host a podcast. You can write a blog. You can become a practitioner in your field. Model behavior to your students. Leading is a verb, just like art is a verb. On your left, this is my friend Ted Drazowski, and I have never made an animated video for a um, music video release. And Ted asked me if I could do it, and I said, yeah, I can do it, sure. And then figured out how to make this really, this, uh, this um, animation for this blues video. Um, so anyway, I put that there because I want to put in throughout here and show you that I'm, I'm kind of practicing, practicing what I preach. I'm always trying to figure out ways to make art. So when I was at Neely's Bend Elementary School, this was a really fun project. Um, we just pretended like Third Man Records, which is Jack White in Nashville, um, came to us and said, hey, will you guys make records? And we had kids make these records. These were based off of a project that the Smithsonian now has all the archives for this guy named Mingering Mike. And in the 60s, Mingering Mike, this guy, no one knows who he is. He's alive and he's given them access to his archive, but he just anonymously as a 16 year old kid invented this character named Mingering Mike. And Mingering Mike has a 40 record career and he physically made the records out of cardboard and drew the thing. They don't ever make music. There's no sound that ever, it's a conceptual project from the beginning. It's like theater set pieces. But they got collected, they got dispersed from him because his storage units changed owners and he was behind like a couple days and all of his stuff got put out. All of that stuff got dispersed and it hit the record collecting scene in DC. And everyone was like, have we missed an important part of the soul canon? Like, they thought, who's Mingering Mike? Because it was like, Mingering Mike, live at the Apollo 62. And they're like, I don't know. We, they know, like, we know, we know who played the Apollo in 62. There's no such thing. Like, that couldn't have been it because James Brown was here in Aretha Front. Like, they were, they, but they were like, they look, and then they pulled them out because they were still in plastic. He would cut the plastic and pull it over. Imagine a 16-year-old. Imagine if you had a 16-year-old kid that, that we taught that was doing something like that. 
but he would pull it over and kind of seal it back. And then they pulled them out and they were like, what is this? Well, the Smithsonian now owns that collection. It's considered one of the greatest pieces of like American folk art in history. So I do that as a project with kids because I say, hey, don't let the little tiny fact that you don't know how to play music stop you from making records, right? Like if we're gonna talk about like doing the impossible, like go ahead, man, have a 40 year career. Collaborate with Bruce Lee and James Brown and all these different things. Don't let something, anything stop you because Ming Green Mike made a whole career. So we put these out. The cool part about that is it was my baptism into Twitter, Third Man Records. I had a blog at the time for our school. Third Man Records tweeted it and I went and saw my blog and it was like one visitor, two visitors. And then the day they tweeted it, it was like 582 visitors. It was so cool to see our kids kind of on the front page and they got really excited. It also started a conversation with the Smithsonian. I reached out to them and uh, that started a 10 year conversation with finding out about the Smithsonian's free stuff that I'll share with you all. Um, and, uh, and now I'm on their rural outreach committee for connecting with rural schools, which I'm excited to connect to all of y'all and give you my number. Sometimes you lead without even knowing it. This is my friend Malia. She's at the Hastings, Florida Potato and Cabbage Festival that came back to Hastings in 2010. It had been dormant for 20 years, and, but it had, is a farming community. Um, it's the largest potato um, growing um, place in the United States outside of Idaho and uh, it's in the middle of this little town of Florida, um, and they didn't have a potato and cabbage festival. Two years before, I had started as a joke at my friend Johnny's restaurant, the International Potato Art Show, because I have little ideas. I can't be Virginia, but Virginia also can't come and do cool International Potato Art Show exhibits in Hastings, Florida. And so I realized like where my wheelhouse is, and so we hosted this potato art show. We had this guy, Chad, who was the um, Hastings, he was the, in Florida, he was the Florida Department of Agriculture's like um, uh, doctor in that area at the Ag Extension. And he came and gave a talk about potatoes, right? And then we had a famous blues musician that someone who lived in Hastings knew and he came and played a show. And then I talked to all my friends at Flagler, because remember I, teach, I taught at Flagler. I was doing that in, at night during my full, regular full-time job. Um, and uh, so all the Flagler professors like put art in it. And so all of a sudden there were like local artists, but then there was these Flagler artists and it really started pushing around like, and we're all making art with potatoes. Like it was so much fun. And, um, and so that really did help start a conversation in the community about bringing back a festival that allowed Hastings to pull down $15,000 from the tourism. It allowed the Parks and Rec Department to kind of come and be part of it. I was part of the Hastings Rotary Club at the time, kind of had my arm twisted by a friend to say, hey, go join that club and figure out a way to help them do cool stuff. And we ran the festival and made a bunch of money. Well, guess where that money goes in Rotary Club? It doesn't go to the Rotary Club. It goes to Southwoods Elementary School. So they got $4,000 of books because I made a stupid potato show. Like, so I, for me, I've had so many, not just anecdotal, but like things backed up where like doing the thing that I love, the passion that I have, which happens to be art and how it can kind of connect. This is me with a ponytail with a group of kids from the Hour Center. So that was the after school program. Does anyone want to see weird potato art? Okay, I see a lot. <laughs> so this you just used a potato and so everyone did a different thing. So these were, these were paintings about potatoes, right? And then this is one of my favorite pieces of art ever. My friend Leslie, um, these are Victorian kind of little medallions, right? What was the cameos. name for them? Cameos. So they're cameos. So guess what the silhouettes are? Potatoes. But what are they made out of? Potatoes. They're made out of deep fried potatoes, <laughs> right? So she cut the potato shapes for all of these people. And then, um, so th there was a farmer that walks in. He doesn't know there's a potato art show. And he's just kind of like a local <laughs> celebrity, kind of like just, uh, he's just kind of grumpy in the way. Like he's kind of professionally grumpy, but a super nice guy, but also just kind of like, he just does his thing. 
But he comes in, he sees this and he goes, what's this? And my friend Leslie's there and I said, go talk to him. Like, when have you had a chance to like sell art to a potato farmer? And I said, this guy has 500 <laughs> acres of potato. Go talk to him. This is cool. So he goes, how much is this? And she's like, um, I was thinking $200. And he pulls his wallet out and just peels off two $100 bills. And he goes, I'll, I'll be taking this home. And he just takes it off the wall and walks out of the building. But also when you walked in there, I at the time worked at the, our 21st Century Community Learning Center. We had a food bank and clothing pantry, right? So our kids at that school were free and reduced lunch, right? Just like in Mount Pleasant now, 75% um, of those kids are living at or below the poverty line. So through the food bank, I'd met Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter had just told me that his wife made really good sweet potato pies. So he was selling sweet potato pies on the hood of his Ford pickup truck, like whole pies for like $5. Y'all, it was the coolest. Like there's nothing that's happening in Nashville that's cooler than what happened here. And I don't mean to say that to brag, I just mean it was so real, right? And I think that's the thing that I think is important about our communities. Let's not try to be someone else. Like, let's just be ourselves and be the best version of ourselves, And you'll find that it's a rich, incredible, beautiful experience, right? The people that live in your town, the artists that live there, the quilters, the people who are making ceramics, the people who are playing music, like they're making beautiful music. They're making beautiful art, right? It doesn't have to look like the stuff that you would see in a gallery. Virginia, interestingly enough, would be the first one to tell you that. She is not snooty about work. She grew up on a farm. She incorporates a lot of that into her own work. But this was a really, really fun thing. The same artist also made this. This is the Venus de Milo carved out of a potato. <coughs> but she made up a video that there was a person who like really liked making potato art but not use their hands, so they were gnawing it. <laughs> and so it's like a fictitious character and she made a video and y'all people had so much fun and not once did anyone think that we were making fun because we had took so much time and so much care they could tell like nobody's doing this to make fun of me like this is they they just people were taking pictures of that little Venus de Milo and it was just it was a really great um great experience this is my friend Kathy Kathy passed away a couple years back Kathy worked for Universal Studios for years. She worked on a bunch of films. She was an incredible artist and she, I just love that she's there not looking at her own work, but looking at other people's work. So I do a found object sculpture workshop where we just take junk. This might be something that if you all are interested in, if anyone has art teachers that you wanna to connect to me, I'm happy to. But also this is stuff that doesn't have to happen in an art classroom. I have been running a version of the Inglewood Found Object Sculpture Society. I started it in Hastings, Florida. This was the very first ever event. I just take buckets of junk, hot glue guns, and a couple hours of time and kids come in and they go, what is this? And I go, I don't know yet, what do you think it is? And then they start making stuff. And sometimes they make weird guns and sometimes they make weird cars. You used to could go into Home Depot and ask for $250 gift cards. Post Katrina, almost all of those stores changed their corporate giving policy. Um, but some of those are swinging back. Tractor Supply, I've had really good luck with them. I haven't even spent it this year, but they'll do $150 for like bird seed or any of those kinds of things. I've done it twice now. Two years in a row, I've just reached out to my local Tractor Supply and said, hey, will y'all give me bird seed? Because I like to feed birds with kids, especially kindergartners. Oh my God, they love it, y'all. Kindergartners think it's the best thing ever to, to feed birds. Y'all, at the after school program, we'd take pianos apart. Because, you know, people will give you free pianos if you'll go pick them up. And, uh, and then they don't, I don't tell them that I'm going to take them apart. But it's like, well, it's going to sit here forever or I can take it away, you know. Um, and, man, kids had so much fun taking this apart. Um, but I have, I do these workshops a lot. And the thing that's interesting and why I have it here is how opportunities yield opportunities. I also then got invited by Virginia to run this, sound, this found object workshop at Storm King. Storm King's in upstate New York, and it's like one of the premier sculpture trails in the world. So there's work there by Maya Lin, who did the Vietnam War Memorial. There's work there by Andy Goldsworthy. There's, it's just like a big deal. It's like, but it's a big outdoor sculpture park. So I got to go to New York, and they paid for me to go up there and like, um, you know, make like funky junk objects with kids. And then, I also got invited by the Art Institute to run a faculty workshop for them. And these are really fun faculty workshops. 
to run um, because it really takes everyone out of their comfort zone. Because inside of the Art Institute, there's English teachers and history teachers, and not everyone's an art teacher necessarily, a visual art teacher necessarily. So that's just something that I do. And again, it's a way for me to be a leader inside of my field in relationship to like found objects. Um, many of you who are interested in STEAM know about maker spaces. Does anyone use breaker spaces? Do you know about breaker spaces? So you just put objects in a room and let kids take those apart. And they learn about how things get taken apart by taking them apart. And then they start kind of putting them together. So there's this whole kind of like side or subculture of breaker spaces where you're just taking old VCRs, old mic, whatever the thing is. There are a couple pieces, just like just research. There's a couple things. There's like some, what are the little things in TV? There's some things that you're not supposed to really get a hold of. Capacitors. The capacitors can be problematic. But other than that, gloves, screwdrivers, goggles, you're good to go. Credibility for me personally in my career, like credibility, receipts, and social media has become a big point, right? You'll notice in my, in this talk, because I'll start going to it a little bit more, but like I have a pretty strong social media presence. It doesn't mean I have a ton of people on social media, but I do have a fairly rich connection with people on social media. For me, I believe it's an important tool for celebrating students, right? Not all parents can make it up to family nights. Not all parents um, are gonna be able to get off um, for those kinds of events. Not all parents, maybe we haven't built the trust enough for them to be there, but often they can, I can tell kids will say, hey, I showed my mom this on Instagram. She was really excited. I talked to a senior the other day and said, hey, Sixth Avenue Skate Shop, reposted the picture of you, the skateboard you made. We'll get to that later. Skateboards is a big part of this. Um, and she was so excited. I was like, yeah, they've got like 10,000 followers. She's like, I'm famous. And she was genuinely excited about that. Guys, Makey Makey is something that you might be interested in. Um, it's a little doodad. I have one in my bag that you plug into a computer and it makes anything that conducts electricity into like a key from your computer. So you can make a spoon the up arrow, right? Yeah. Stick with me here. You can make the spoon the up arrow. And if you use scratch coding, right? And say, when you press up, make the meow sound. And so when you touch the spoon, the cat meows. <laughs> it's fantastic. I don't know anything about coding. I don't know that much. One thing I've always done as an educator, I've tried to do, I've always tried to every year learn something new in relationship to tech. But listen to me, I don't try to necessarily keep up with all tech. I just try to learn a new thing every year. So one year I learned scratch coding. I went to a workshop, it was free. Scratch coding is just like the block coding that you can do. It's very easy, um, even for my, um, I think it's safe to say we're all, Natalie might be an exception, but I, I bet she's probably not. I think we're all digital settlers in this room. You might be a digital native. You're a digital native. The rest of us are probably, there might be a few digital natives, but most of us are digital settlers. Like we came to the internet. Like I dated my wife on a, you know, like on a phone from like Texas, like, hey babe, you know, like had to wait in line to, and I had to memorize my long distance calling card number, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, but so one year I learned scratch coding. I went to this makey makey thing and I just kept at it and they made me a 20, 19 and 2020, make you make you global ambassador. And I met people from all over the world that are also like doing these kinds of things. So for me, that was really fun. And it really was really that easy for me as I started using it in my classroom. What was interesting, I think, is I used it in a way that they never thought about because I was using it for my community. And my community was the art classroom. And so we were doing weird sound things. Many of the people are using it to do and teach strategies for math, science, social studies, history. There, you can build really cool living museum kinds of things. You touch this, you touch Frida Kahlo and she tells you about herself. You touch, you know, this person, Mary Curie, and she tells you about herself. Like that stuff is really awesome. And a lot of people use it very kind of, and I don't mean this in an ugly way, but just kind of really straightforward in that way as these like three-dimensional, interfaces that are hands-on for all of our kinesthetic learners that then has this digital component and people are having wild success. I was just doing it where we touched the spoon and it made a cat noise. 
And then you made this other one, and all of a sudden you're doing like this weird, like almost like DJing kind of chaos kind of thing. And maybe we were on this side of the room touching the wire and just seeing how far away we could get. Because if I hold the spoon and I touch the ground, right? And then we all touch as long as we create a circuit. So you can do a circuit around the room. And so one day in my class at Father Ryan, we just tried to see how far away we could get. You know, and the principal comes in and is like, what are y'all doing? And we just had just old steel wire. I mean, it, there was nothing that looked like art that was happening. You know, and I was just like, we're just investigating some, you know, scientific things. I had kids stay and built the most elaborate doorbell you've ever seen in your life. There was, I, there was a, I inherited a suit of armor. It was a fake, like you could get at Michael's, but it was a big suit of armor. They put something, a speaker in its head, the speaker was Bluetooth to the laptop. They ran copper wire up and out the door and in a cardboard thing. So when you touch the cardboard thing, it created the circuit. And then the guy shouted at you. Somebody at the door. It was fantastic. And they just waited for people to come to lunch and do that thing. <laughs> and like if I would have said, hey, you have to spend your lunch break doing this. Nobody would have wanted to do that. But it was interesting to kind of have those connections where it was something really fun for them. When you get the opportunity, it's kind of weird. Sometimes it's difficult. Take those opportunities to be an expert in your field. So I got invited to be on this podcast. I could think of a bunch of reasons why I didn't have an hour to spend in my day. Um, but I took this opportunity, this incredible woman, Rebecca Potts. She doesn't have a huge followership, maybe 3,000 people, but all 3,000 of those people, I bet 2,500 of them are visual art teachers, K-12. Those are my people, right? So I have random Instagram, like I don't have a bunch of followers and the people are just reaching out to me going, hey, I heard your episode. And I'm like, what? I really liked what you had to say. Oh, I spent an hour talking about how I show kids how to draw their hands and do over 10, like it was so in the, how the sausage is made about how to be an art teacher with specific standards. But I did a podcast episode and it was impactful to someone who now sees me as expert. I'm now following them on Instagram. I'm paying attention to what's going on in their field. And it's interesting. I think that if we do those kinds of things, if we get better and better at kind of putting ourselves out there and like um, not having that false humility, but just claiming our like leadership, our expertise in our own field, I think it, it really can be really uh, interesting thing. Y'all, this is my classroom at Maplewood. So I said on this slide, it's like finding the opportunity in chaos. So I wanna make sure that you don't just hear me saying that Ma Maplewood was chaos. I enabled the chaos. What was chaotic is there's 39 people and kids in a classroom. There doesn't need to be 39. It's just what legally could happen at that time. And it was no one's fault. Ron and Ryan didn't want it to be that way. It's just how it had to be. But also because those kids were there and a lot of them played sports, every classroom I've ever had has a, 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 like a made up basketball goal. Never a Nerf one, you have to make it yourself. That way I can at least say to my principals, man, those guys made that thing. Like they hit some standards here, they were inventive, now they're playing the thing. Yes, Dr. Jackson, and you know, like it was a little embarrassing if a principal walked into getting dunked on, you know, like that. <laughs> But it was always with the like, man, Mike is, he's experimenting and doing stuff. You might see some slides later. My room increasingly got more and more like the set of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. All the tiles got painted, spray paint on the walls. The last conversation I had with, with uh, Dr. Woodard professionally at Maplewood is he came and he goes, this is too much. And I was like, oh, do we need to change it now? And he goes, no, no, we wait till summer. It's cool. He's like, but this is too much. And so there was spray paint on the walls. It was really lovely. But one of the things I wanted to say is in this chaos, these are my kids. Jonathan on the right, y'all um, couldn't be more proud. Jonathan just bought a work of art from me, right? For $500. I'm not bragging because of me. I'm just saying a kid that I taught at that school, a school where sometimes like larger people, not the teachers, not the administrators, but people outside would say, man, I don't know what those kids are going to do. Jonathan has a job right? He has a career. And he reached out and said, hey, I'd like to support you. Can I buy some work from you? And I had just come to the conclusion in my head, I'm not giving discounts anymore. I'm going to say this is a thousand dollars and that's how much it is. And if I have to own them myself, I'll own them myself, but I'm not going to do them for a hundred dollars anymore because they take two years to make these particular pieces. 
But then Jonathan calls and he texts me and I go, hey man, check it out. I just made this decision. I'm gonna charge a grand, but you get the student discount plus your OG from Maplewood. I would take anywhere from $50 to $1,000. And he said, I'll do 500. And he goes, not only that, he goes, I'll do 200 so you know I'm serious and I'll meet you for breakfast and give you the $200. So, but this is when he was a sophomore, Mawish Chishti, who I cold called, who was at the Art Institute, I looked up drone art, because Dr. Jackson's my boss. Y'all, when Dr. Jackson's your boss, there's an expectation that we're going to do something bigger than we did last year, right? And it's gonna be richer, it's gonna impact more kids, it's gonna be awesome. There's just that thing, it's a lovely experience to have, to know that you go to work, that there's gonna be someone who values your job as much as you and is gonna push you even more than you wanna push yourself. It's a really cool experience. So Dr. Jackson, we had done this Maplewood to Mars project with Amanda Valentine, who was on Project Runway. It was pretty awesome. She was like a finalist on Project Runway. She was really cool. She came to our school and worked with our kids because we cold called her. And, um, and so, so it's like, oh, well, how do we top that? Well, he said, what about drones? And we, so I started looking up drone art. The first two names that popped up, one of the people answered my email, this woman, Mawish Chishti. She's now at University of Massachusetts Amherst but she decided she would have a collaborative exhibit with us. She was talking about drones in Pakistan and how many drones, um, how many drone strikes there were. And she was finding there was different numbers than what the US was saying versus what Pakistan was saying. And so we were like, well, that's interesting. Our kids are living in a community that's policed a little bit differently than other ones. So we just started having these conversations. So this is a quarter scale of a predator drone made up of 200 tiles, all, 200 were made by one individual kid in my classroom. So they made up a predator drone. We researched predator drones. We talked about them. She came down because I didn't have the money to pay for her, but Vanderbilt does. And so I reached out to Vanderbilt and said, hey, do you guys have a visiting artist yet for this year? And, he, and my friend John goes, no, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And I go, well, I have an awesome idea. And then I'll gift you this really cool community outreach that Vanderbilt can claim. You can claim 200 kids at Vanderbilt a connection to the Red Arrow Gallery, and I'll just let you have that. And so they paid her all the money. I think they paid her five grand, all the stuff, and that was awesome because I didn't have to do it. And it put good money in a good person's pocket who would not have thought about that and helped her build. At the time, she was at the Art Institute of Chicago as an adjunct professor. It helped build her career because she came to Nashville. Well, she didn't know, and I didn't know, that Nashville was going to become this city that suddenly on her resume looked a little different, right? So it's kind of cool to get to be part of that trajectory. So the paintings on the wall were made by kids in my classroom, flying drones full of, with cups of paint attached to them and smashing them into the wall, hitting that kind of target. We had the US military um, drone pilots come in and talk to us. We had artists come in. We really, really, really did a full kind of science, technology, engineering, art, math event. Fall Hamilton is an elementary school here in Nashville. Their principal reached out and said, hey, you guys are doing a cool project with drones. And Dr. Jackson said, you need to go to Fall Hamilton. And I was like, I've only done this with high school kids. And the time the drone flew and got caught in a girl's hair, she was at least cool about it. And, but little kids is different. He's like, man, just go and figure it out. And I was like, okay. And so we went and worked with a group of kids and they got to fly the drone and make these these things. The cool thing is it kind of makes really fun paintings, the kind of splashy, abstract kind of looking things. We sold a couple of those paintings for $500. Um, that money, Katie took what she needed for a gallery and then that money came back into the art department. We did all that through a bookkeeper, right? So we went through that painful process of making sure, so we had to fundraiser requests and all those different kinds of things. If I get on YouTube, can I find a video on drone art and how they do it? Yep. You won't necessarily find ours, but you'll find a bunch. You'll find a bunch of different things. Yeah, because people have gotten really sophisticated with it now. Drones have become more sophisticated. We didn't have a drone to make art. We bought a drone. I, used a, I did a donor's choose. Metro National Public Schools and Murray County, I've been lucky enough where both of the public school systems I've worked in have been friendly to Donors Choose. And Donors Choose is like GoFundMe for teachers. It's specifically built for public school teachers and you can write a grant and then it gets crowdsourced. The way it works in Murray County, I 
principal. I'd like to do a fundraiser request. It's a GoFundMe. It's not going to pull any money from their sports stuff. Oh, it's not going to affect anything. <laughs> it's a real concern. I, you saw I played basketball, man. I need new uniforms, right? So, and it, it comes from outside. It's also scrubbed by typically, like for in Murray County, they, they approve it. It gets a stamp and it comes back and then you can, you can do little mini grants inside your classroom. Last year, I got $1,000 worth of disc golf for our uh, PE teacher at the, at the middle school. Man, disc golf is so fun, y'all. Using disc golf to talk about algebra and negative numbers and all that stuff. Pardon? Projectiles. Projectiles, trajectory, drag, all the different things. A thousand dollars worth of it. Edge disc golf, and it's the real stuff. Like when it came, it wasn't cheapo stuff. It's Edge Company, which is Innova, and it's connected to the Disc Golf Association. That whole community is dying for all of us to connect to them. They'll put you on the front page of their like newspaper if you send them stuff. I can, can I'm, but, and when I say this, you guys have to understand, you don't have to understand, I don't mean it that way, but do understand I'll take time and stop what I'm doing and connect you to these folks. I really will. Dr. Jackson will say, hey man, yeah, you can take an hour and connect those folks from, to the, the Innova folks. Your disc golf community that you live near, raise your hand if you're aware that you live near a disc golf community. All right, the, Rome Rome County County Park. Park. Yeah. And those folks, that thousand dollars happened so fast because they're like, wait, kids are interested in disc golf. Within a week, a guy called the school, wrong school, called the high school, needed to call the middle school. Well, then, hey, man, Mike Mitchell, somebody needs to talk to you from the high school. Hey, um, I'm a pro. I just competed last week. And can I come to your school and show kids how to throw disc golf? Yeah, Mike, you come on, man. And he came and he did. And he threw that thing about a million miles and kids lost their mind. It was so much fun. And that just happened because, you know, through a, through a very easy thing, Coach Pickett's an awesome guy. Again, I talked about building capacity. I won't write Corey's grants for him anymore. I wrote one, showed him how it worked, showed him how the stuff. I'll be a support for him the next time. But my goal is, is to position teachers to be able to know how to do those things. And then you're just bugging him and him and him to just fill out the thing. Cause they look and go like, right on man, write another one of those, you know, get into some money, right? So it also helps him with his community partners. Hey man, why are you always asking us for money? Be like, man, every teacher in our building wrote a donor's choose. Well, then they start going, wait a second. I might be interested in matching. What are we talking about here? Hey, we had our whole math department, right? They raised $2,000 this quarter. Although, I mean, you know how that kind of stuff works. As long as people don't feel like they're being fleeced, mm -hmm. they'll get more excited. Like, man, they're pulling their weight. That's cool. Or you position them with a really easy thing. Y'all, Lady Gaga bought us yoga mats. Isn't that weird? <laughs> she has a, a nonprofit. We had the right keywords in on our yoga mat project. Her nonprofit is really, 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 really hyper-focused on body image with kids. Our grant, we didn't intentionally do that, but we talked about that, that yoga is one of those activities that can help kids be active in super comfortable clothing, right? I don't like showing my belly. Like, I personally, and when I was in high school, I was conscious about it, even though I was fit. Like it's, so, like, of course, younger kids don't. So, like Molly wrote this thing like, hey, yoga allows us to have kind of snuggly clothes. We can just kind of be ourselves and we can make fun moves and stretch and really get, do these physical things. And we must have hit those right codes because it just said the so-and-so foundation just matched your, they just, if we needed 600 more dollars and they just paid for all of it. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot with donors <coughs> choose. Um, and then I looked and found out who it was and I was like, of course I go on Twitter and say, hey, thanks Lady Gaga tagging her hoping, right? You would hope that she would like retweet it. It didn't happen, but that's okay. It still got other people's attention because they're like, wow, did Lady Gaga really buy y'all yoga mats? Well, kind of, right? She didn't go, hey, I want to buy some yoga mats for some rural kids in Tennessee, but someone at her organization saw that and kind of kept doing that. So y'all collaborating for me inside of a building is one of my favorite things. We made up this thing called the book of reading with my friend Jer Jared Amato. And this book, I didn't know what to do with it. It's like a sketchbook. It's a really fancy one that my friend got me and it has like handmade paper. So we created the book of reading. And when you finished a book in Mr. Amato's class that he had assigned to you, you got to come to my class. You got to get out of class at Maplewood, walk all the way down to the basement. And you got to knock on the door and come into another class 
and you got to, Mr. Mitchell like got this book out and I made it like a special thing. I kind of said, hey man, sorry, I got, I'm, not, I'm working. I got to get the book of reading out. And I got the book of reading out and I like, hey, can I move your stuff? And I moved it and I sat the book of reading here and everyone's going like, what is he doing? And then I go, I go to this little special thing. I've got these little cards. Y'all, these are high school students. You think what I'm talking about only works with little kids. It actually works with all kids. I had hand stamped these bookmarks and they got to sign the book of reading, right? Gave a phone to somebody who's not doing anything. Hey, can you get up and take our picture? What's this for? It's the book of reading. They finished a book. Isn't that cool? And some people would kind of like, oh, you finished a book. And some people are like, hey, right on. And you started identifying readers like, hey, I've read a book like suddenly. So anyway, that was just from someone else's class. Well, why can I do that? Well, I'm an art teacher. I don't have deliverables in the same way that you guys who are ELA teachers have and who are math teachers and who are special needs teachers, right? You guys have too many IEPs to be the book of reading teacher. I'm not asking anyone to do that, but I am just sharing like ways in which a little idea can turn into something pretty giant. Here's someone signing the book of reading. We got it down to where it felt like a holy moment. It was really cool, right? Can you imagine like kids? This was 2015, the internet existed. There were cell phones and kids would kind of stop what they were doing to sign the book of reading and get their little card. Now, I don't care that they were probably excited just to take way too long to walk to my class, to Jared's class. <laughs> Whatever, man, like they read a book and if that got them over the hump, like that was important, right? I love this one because my hair's like kind of sticking up and it like, it, we all three, our hair, you can kind of see negative space. I'm an art teacher. So you always see the positive and negative space. And these two young guys are so, it's so cool. Um, and, and so it was fun that they would just, and they never said, no, I don't want to take a picture with you. They were always excited to take a picture about the book of reading. So she was really excited about hers. All right, skateboarding. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about. Well, it turns out kids love skateboarding. So skateboarding became a really big part. We made skateboards at Maplewood. We partnered with Sixth Avenue Skate Shop where I take my kids skating. They let us have an exhibit. Every skateboard you see behind you was either modified and or built by these kids. I had to put this one in there just because she has this board that says Jada's best friend. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. But I also wanted to show you how crazy my room got um, and how much fun kids had. The county reached out and said, do you want like 5,000 ceiling tiles? You know what my answer was, yep. Man, I always have communities draw birds and this is a little abstract bird is so fun because it's like, it doesn't make sense that this would read like Woody or Downy Woodpecker because it's not particularly like, like these things are just real kind of jagged and this is kind of like a C, but it really, they got the Woody, the Downy Woodpecker compared to the next thing, which is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life, which is the bling bling bird. <laughs> Imagine the idea that you would connect a kid to the idea of ornithology. So we were looking at Cornell's website. We were doing the work. We were really doing the thing. I just wasn't saying, hey, I need your stuff to look like all the other drawings of birds have ever looked. And this kid makes, in my opinion, <laughs> one of the greatest things ever. He made this bird from his neighborhood that kind of looked like him. And it's so fun to me that he would be able to make this, this happen. So yeah, just a bird that has a gold chain, a gold necklace. I love a bird that just has that much swagger. And then so what I was able to talk to him about is like, hey, do you know that cardinals that live in the Northeast and cardinals that live in the South have different accents? <laughs> they do, they sound different because of barometric pressure, like all these different things. They, tr they don't sound like appreciably different to like, most of us humans, but to those bird nerds like my mother-in-law, they can tell the difference between a bird from the Northeast. Like they have different, and so like what a cool conversation to be able to have to say, hey man, you're actually right on. Birds can have personality too. And I just love that this bird is a bird that would have gone to Maplewood High School. That was about chaos. You know, one of the things I think is important is a lot of times our, our schools that we teach in are very under control, right? There isn't intense things that's throwing us off. We can sometimes confuse that for like, well, then things are exactly the way they are. We don't need to like move and do things in a different way. Um, so at Father Ryan, I'd never been in an environment where there was just like so little discipline. Cause I could look at you and just be like, man, I don't like the way you're crossing your arms. 
that's a Saturday detention. I, matter of fact, I'm going to go make $20 extra an hour and I'm going to see you on Saturday. Like you could do, I mean, no one would do that. God, that'd be terrible if you were that kind of person. But the point was, is the administration would back you up and go, hey man, if he was crossing his arms and being rude, like that's a, that's a write-up. Like we don't put up with any of that stuff. And you wouldn't get a call from parents. They would just be like, I guess he was being disrespectful. And I was like, what is happening? This is kind of awesome, right? Like it took me too long to realize I had too many conversations and it, which is a whole nother thing about leadership is I had to, I tried to impose my culture on them. If you had conversations over and over again, they would just keep being disrespectful. I had to go, Hey man, that's a, that's a write up. And they're like, Oh, Oh my bad. And then you could have a conversation. It was a real interesting thing for me to figure out how to live inside of a different culture in a way that was respectful to the culture. Cause I was not being respectful to that kid to suddenly come to them and do a wildly different discipline plan than they'd experienced K through 12 and expect them to understand what I was talking about. They just thought I was a pushover and I was telling them like, Hey, I just, you know, you can get over. So, but, um, but what that allowed is like room for all sorts of stuff. So this project was making cubes. We worked with my friend Meg, who's the head of psychiatric medicine at Vanderbilt. And we made coping cubes that they used in the psychiatric children's hospital. We worked with those doctors, with our kids. We made emojis so that kids could roll the die. They used them to role play with their therapist. How are you feeling today? And they would like be able to use the cube and they genuinely used them in therapy. It was a really kind of cool experience. This is a, a new start to success. This is at the Day Reporting Center in Madison, Tennessee, Department of Corrections. So we would go to Pearl Cohn. Pearl Cohn and Father Ryan famously played the first integrated basketball game between black students and white students in Nashville's history. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do something off the court collaboratively? So my friend Tracy was the art teacher there. We became pals and we would take kids at Father Ryan who needed service project hours. We would go there not to serve those kids. It was really important to not say those kids were broken. We would find something that needed to be fixed in our agreed upon community. The Day Reporting Center had reached out and they needed some art. So we worked with all those kids and they made this work together. And we would go over there and hang out. You can see kids in Catholic skirts. Y'all, a kid from Father Ryan went to Pearl Cones prom my senior year. I mean, the last year I was there. It was the coolest thing. They just went as friends. That guy needed a date. She didn't have a date, but they'd met through this because she'd gone to all of her service projects and even came when she didn't need any more service hours because she had just felt a community there that she had not quite experienced. Um, this kid is one of the great golfers in Tennessee right now. As a freshman, he was shooting like three under. Y'all, he was so excited about those Pearl Cone girls. He was not, like everybody else was a little kind of nervous and like they weren't sure what to do. And he just got in there and just started hanging out. And he was like, man, this is awesome. Like, this is so much fun. And, and uh, he just had a great time just kind of getting to know. Um, I'd said, you can volunteer. I, when my kid was little, I'd always volunteer in his classroom. And of course I take saws, cause I, you know, like why not take saws and um, nail guns to the classroom? But we built this cool little reading room in this fun? So the teacher can still see the kid, but the kid felt private in that space. I actually know all these kids still. They're in school with my kids still. This is me and my mom just hanging out a couple weeks ago. This painting's based off of Ray Barbie, who was one of the seminal skateboarders of the 1990s. The edges of it are made out of old skateboard decks, so their edges are real colorful. I ripped them down so that you have the edges there. Student ticket subsidy grants. We took all of first grade to see the children's theater. Guys, on student ticket subsidy, there's a list of visiting artists that can come to your school. Storytellers, fiddlers, cloggers, um, repertory theaters, ballet, and they'll come to your school and do performances and it costs zero dollars. Now you do have to find the funds to initially pay right? And then it gets reimbursed. That reimbursement process happens pretty quickly. So there is that caveat. I know that that can be a hump, but I think it cost us $1,400 to take those kids, right? But 100% of it's reimbursed and they all got to go see Peter Pan, which was first grade was teaching. Once a month, I do Culture Corner, specifically with black artists from Nashville for the Educators Cooperative that I'm part of. It's a way for us to just highlight folks. If you've seen that top left corner, Jerry Pentecost is the current drummer for Old Crow Medicine Show. He is so awesome. He's one of the great living drummers. 
Um, and he, there's a lot of, he talks a lot about it. He's one of the few black drummers in kind of contemporary country music and uh, Americana music. And man, is he an unbelievable resource. And just was like, hey, y'all just reach out to me if you need help with stuff. He substitute taught a little bit in Murfreesboro, which we got real nerded out because we're like, you did what we do? Like, oh my goodness. He was in the green room at Red Rocks Amphitheater and did our call with us. It was really neat. So once a month we do calls. This is Donna Woodley. She teaches at Austin P State University and is the foundation's like professor up there. Diddley Bows and Space Force. Space Force is doing a new thing where they're coming out. They did a model project with us. They fired off rockets. I don't know why they put me on the front page of the paper, but when they do, I always keep it for my mom because she really loves that stuff. As do I, I think it's cool. Um, but Diddley Bows, I want to play this Diddley Bow for you. I don't know if you guys have forgotten that it's here. So I always get the cafeteria involved. You'll be surprised, the men and women in the cafeteria, that they'll keep these things for you and they'll get real excited. Like, what are you doing? And then they'll check in on you. Are you using those yet? What's going, do you need more? Because no one ever asks them for anything, right? When I say no one, I don't mean y'all. I just mean that it can, sometimes they just, we can forget about them. To include them in our kids' education. They are teachers in our building. They are leaders in our building. So they gave me these. And then this is an old skateboard deck. This cost about 75 cents to make. That tuning peg, you can get them for, if you get them in bulk, maybe a dollar. Um, the jars can become a really cool project for all you ELA folks. So this is a picture of Colleen, my grandmother, who died when I was 18. Um, and inside are the actual Scrabble tiles that she and I played with that spell her name. And they become my shake for when I'm playing the blues. So. We made 20 of those this year. I taught the art teacher how to make them. I'll teach our new art teacher how to make those. Super easy to make, super fun to make. I'm sure everyone in here can figure out how that can connect to your subject matter. Maybe you want to talk about history. Well, that happened during early American South. A guitar would come through town, then that guitar would leave, and we're going to bake a guitar. We're going to have bailing wire, we're going to have nails, doorposts, and at some point, they played a Coke bottle and then someone cut that thing and put it on the lap. Next thing you know, we're playing slide guitar. Like that's steam and STEM right there. That's the history of STEM and STEAM in our country came through blues men and women. It's not the only thing, but it is a cool part of our history, right? That sharecroppers, like people were making those, people were making banjos, right? Like white folks and black folks, poor rural areas were all building instruments. I think that's really cool, right? It's a neat thing. So we did 20 of those. We have a recording studio at Mount Pleasant High School. We, um, second grade postcard project. We sent postcards to Nashville. Little free skate shop. I, we gave away 20 skateboards complete this year through the help from Sixth Avenue Skate Shop and local um, skaters. Y'all, we got on the cover of Thrasher, we got on, not on the cover, but we got on the website of Thrasher Magazine, Erica Gonzalez. Her family went up to Sixth Ave and they did a little documentary. I mean, it is, the most important skateboard cultural thing in the world is Thrasher Magazine. And one of our kids got on that magazine. I mean, in, on the website. She met Samaria Brevard, who's the first female black skater on the cover of Thrasher. She met Tiago, who's the greatest, he's like the greatest Brazilian skater of all time. I mean, they literally got to meet them. And Rolling Stone's Wild Horses, he came and signed a bass for us for our um, recording studio. Uh, I love podcasting, so this podcast was with kids, and they interviewed Alicia Bagnano of Bully. At the time, she had the number one song on college radio. She's like a real-life rock star who does collaborations with Adidas. And um, then Craig Haverkirst, who's housed here, WMOT. Craig's one of the great living scholars of roots music in America. Do you know how I got his attention? I bugged him to the point of he finally sent me a text back on Twitter and said, hey man, can you send an email? What do you want? Now he, was, he sent me that text because I wasn't doing anything untoward. It was all from my kid's account. Like he, was, he clearly was like, I get it, you're a teacher. He's like, what do you want? 
And we met at a Starbucks about 30 minutes from here because I drove over because I'm like, man, if Craig Havercurst wants to have a conversation, then I'll have a conversation. So he came and was on our podcast and we had talked about doing a tour. My assumption is if he'd do a tour with me, he'd probably do a tour with other folks. I know that MTSU is not necessarily connected uh, or the same distance from all schools, but we also interviewed Spencer Coates from Fame Studios and Muscle Shoals, which was awesome. This is a podcast we did as a project, the Tennessee Department, not Tennessee, the Department of Homeland Security and the McCain Institute have an anti-terrorism project called Invent to Prevent that our kids participated in year. We got fourth place in the United States. Third place, we would have gone to DC. I'm gonna just, oh man, we would have sent kids to DC to present in front of the Undersecretary of Homeland Security. Um, but we bought a bunch of credibility because we are competing against 20 other schools across the United States. And we did this podcast called Kindness Can Cure um, with, with 10 episodes and we got freshmen to take it over for next year. So we have a contingency plan that we didn't even, I didn't think that that would happen. I host these podcasts. Again, I'm trying to be an expert in my field. And so I have a podcast called Drawing South, which is me just talking to friends. And then as a volunteer thing for the Tennessee Art Education Association, I host the Art of Outreach, which interviews artists from the Appalachia foothills to Memphis and talking about those experience. That first episode is with Bonnie. If you wanna cry, you could listen to that episode with Bonnie. Bonnie was one of the teachers in Waverly that lost everything in her classroom and a student, but still was coming back to like be, right? And I say that because I know all of us here have those kinds of stories. We all have those stories of like, yep, but we came back on Monday, which by the way, thank you. Cause like in your communities, like it's so powerful that we, are up to this. Like sometimes it's overwhelming to me that this is what we're up to. Everyone in here could do something else, right? But we don't, we do this. And whatever that thing is, man, if it's football, bat, like whatever, I have zero judgment on that. If you wanna to connect to kids and help them like navigate their community, I think it's heroic. Here are resources that might be of interest. Peg Catch, you would just email her, hey, Mike talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And he said you would answer an email, and she will. So she's doing the reach from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. They have a menu. You want to talk about Native American stuff. They pull from their collection at the Smithsonian, and they do a video conference with you and your kids about whatever topics you want. You control what she pulls from the Smithsonian. You can send her lesson plans. She'll be wildly collaborative to the point of where you're like, hey, Peg, we can kind of see how this goes. We don't have to figure it all out. But she'll, she'll get into it, or she'll say, hey, yeah, just well, here's what I've got and you can have your kids, but she'll video, it's zero dollars. And there's really no limit on how many you can do. She said a lot of times teachers, she couldn't figure out why teachers did it once and then never did it again. I was like, Peg, we're just not used to people being this nice to us. We just don't know. We think we're being greedy. And she goes, is that really why? And I go, yeah. I guarantee you they want to do it again. They just feel greedy. Man, I don't want to take his spot. Like they need it. And she's like, well, tell them to stop thinking that. And I was like, well, good luck. Like, but anyway, um, Educators Cooperative is a free thing. I'm part of it, Natalie's part of it. Um, there's a free PD every summer. It's a week long, it's, it's, a five, it's 25 hours of PD. Um, and then we just do all sorts of things. Um, Critical Friends Group, I'm connected to four people kind of forever that I um, can call. So that's Allison and Chris and um, Amberly. And they're all different kinds of teachers. So Amberly's a second grade teacher, Addison's an ELA teacher, Chris is a PE teacher, and I'm an art teacher. But we get together and do the critical friends, uh, the tuning protocol, and we'll bring something to each other because we believe that teachers can actually solve lots of problems by ourselves with the ideas that we have. And we're all cross sector, we're all cross. So, so nobody has to feel weird about talking about anybody because we don't know the politics of anybody's given school. We just try to solve the problem. Um, Here's the thing that I just love. This is Mariana. We have the power to give others permission to be themselves. She has so much fun playing guitar. And I'm just so grateful that I have smart enough to put one in front of her, you know, like. And what took me so long? I knew her for a year before I did it. But when I did, it reminds me. We have to put guitars in front of everybody. We have to put footballs in front of everybody. We have to put skateboards in front. We have to put stuff in front of kids. We have to trust them. And if she breaks the guitar, oh well, 
right? We'll get another one. Kids don't know how to treat stuff unless you give them stuff to treat one way or the other. And then you get to have really deep conversations. Hey, man, you broke this. It's a thousand dollars. We're gonna have to get another. And but the other option is he doesn't learn how to do with it, deal with anything. Like to me, I think that I'm not suggesting you just give people thousand dollar stuff to break, but I do think you have to learn how to trust kids with stuff. So we can you see it? It's got a clamp from Home Depot to clamp it to the table. That's not a way to treat a guitar, but it's a fairly old guitar, and we'll pick that guitar, and you know what? Mariana's worth it. You know, she's worth that guitar. And she's having that much fun. And when I play harmonica, she vocalizes, right? She doesn't sing the way I sing, but she sings. It's pretty awesome. So we have the power to, to give others permission to be themselves. Y'all, that's my jam. That's my thing.